This video will cover some basics of cell biology. While other introductions to cell biology focus more on breadth than depth, in this video I will specifically focus and discuss in detail the size and the boundary of typical cells in our body. Before I describe the cell in any detail, it is necessary to talk about what a cell really is. The cell is often called the basic unit for life. And even though our bodies are made of trillions of cells, some living organisms are made entirely of a single cell. All cells are believed to come from pre-existing cells. Cells can replicate and multiply through a process known as cell division, which gives a rise to, to new cells. The boundary between the outside and the inside of a cell is most clearly defined as the plasma membrane. This membrane is a lipid bilayer, a structure that keeps the chemical reactions inside the cell from leaking out. We will return to the exact structure of this membrane in a moment. Another thing to note about cells is that they are very small. Most cells cannot be seen with the naked eye, and their existence was unknown until the microscope was invented. With better and more powerful microscopes, scientists could see smaller structures inside the cell, which they called organelles, which roughly translates to little organs. There are many other, even smaller structures and molecules in the cell that cannot be seen with a, tr with a traditional microscope. Cells come in a variety of sizes, but they are all very small. They are all microscopic. Why are these cells so tiny? To answer that, let's consider the difference between surface area and volume of everyday objects. If we take a spherical object, object, such as a lollipop, the surface area is greater than the volume. If we take a spherical object, a small one such as a lollipop, the volume is not much greater than the surface area. It's much easier to, or quicker, to cover the entire surface area of a pop than to lick the entire volume and get to the middle. But the difference in time to do one and the other is not so great. For bigger spheres, like the Earth, for example, the ratio between surface area and volume is much different. The volume is many times larger than the surface area. While it would take you a long time to cover the entire surface area of the Earth, it would take you many, many more times that to cover the entire volume of the Earth. Even though they are very tiny, the same principle is true for cells. The bigger the cell, the greater disparity there is between surface area and volume. Again, this translates into meaning that the larger the cell, the more difficult it is for molecules to get into the middle. As you increase the size, overall size of the cell a little bit, reaching the center becomes much harder. This, in short, is the reason why cells are not that big. For one more example, to drive this point home, think about Manhattan in New York City. Here, we'll pretend like the city is a cell, and that the surface area, or the membranes, will be the roads. If you had roads that went into the middle, it wouldn't be def difficult to get to the spots of the city that are in the middle, like Washington Square Park. However, if the only membrane or surface 
of the cell that was available was the outside. Or if, to use the city analogy, the only roads were available was the FDR and the West Side Highway, it would be really tough to get into the middle of the city. As we will see later, large cells often have additional inroads um, similar to the cross streets and avenues of the city that allows materials to get to the middle in a reasonably efficient way. So what actually defines the size of the surface area and the volume of the cell? What sort of shape are we talking about when we talk about the cell? And how do we know what's on the inside of a cell and what's on the outside? The boundary of a cell is the plasma membrane, which is simply a lipid bilayer. These lipid bilayers are formed from a special type of molecule known as a phospholipid. Phospholipids, like the one shown here, have both a nonpolar hydrocarbon chain and a polar group that can interact with water. These lipids arrange themselves in a bilayer structure in order to shield the hydrophobic or nonpolar parts from the water. This bilayer structure forms a membrane that acts as a boundary between the outside of the cell or the extracellular space and the inside of the cell. We will see that these membranes can form additional compartments as well. This membrane is able to separate out two spaces or two watery solutions because the nonpolar layer prevents polar and charged molecules from crossing from one side to the other. For cells, this means that they can keep ions, proteins, carbohydrates, and other molecules safely inside the cell without worrying about them spilling out into the outside. In fact, many of these molecules cannot cross the membrane at all to either exit or to enter the cell. Their movement across the membrane is regulated by special protein gates or channels which control what gets in the cell and what leaves. The inside of the cell is normally known as the cytoplasm. This is where a lot of the reactions and activity in the cell takes place. Here is another view of a typical membrane. On the left you can see a membrane separating the extracellular space from the cytoplasm. Note the scale on this electromicrograph. You could also see in the cartoon representation a lipid bilayer with a protein spanning the length or the width of the layer. Our cells don't just have a single bilayer for the outside and inside. They can have several bilayers or membranes, each separating parts of the cell into different compartments. For example, here we see the boundary of the cell, known as the plasma membrane, with the extracellular space on one side and the cytoplasm on the, on the inside. And within the cytoplasm, within the space of the cell, another membrane compartment, separating the nucleus from the cytoplasm. In fact, our cells have many separate membrane-bound organelles. Each is like a little bag or a separate compartment in the cell. Remember, the phospholipid bilayer is used as a membrane because it does not allow most molecules to move across. It acts as a barrier. Let's again look at our plasma membrane. It's not simply a plain arrangement of lipids in a bilayer. Instead, our plasma membrane is made up of more than just lipids. It includes proteins, carbohydrates, different types of lipids, cholesterol molecules, and several other types of molecules. Proteins can be found attached to the periphery of the membrane, and some proteins actually span across the length of the membrane, contacting both the extracellular side and the cytoplasmic side. Other proteins are actually chemically bonded or linked to the lipids, or linked to carbohydrate molecules. There can be a network of molecules on the outside surface of the membrane covering the cell and may connect it to what is known in some tissues as the extracellular matrix or the surrounding, surrounding features of, this, of the tissue. There is also, on the cytoplasmic side, a network of molecules and proteins 
that are connected to the plasmic mem plasma membrane. These often connect to the cytoskeleton, which help give structure to the cell. This picture shows a, short, a sort of snapshot of the plasma membrane. However, these components don't simply sit still in the membrane, frozen as they are in this picture. The membrane of our cells has fluidity. That is to say that the lipids and proteins stay in the bilayer, but they can move about within it, and they don't necessarily stay in one spot in the membrane move across to different regions of the membrane. The fluidity of the membrane depends on a number of different factors, including the exact lipids that they are composed of and the temperature the membrane is in. For example, saturated fatty acids pack together tighter and have less fluidity than unsaturated fatty acid chains, which are kinked and cannot pack together tight. This difference in fluidity might be easier to remember if you think of common saturated and unsaturated fats. Butter is a saturated fat and is normally found as a solid, while olive oil is more fluid and is usually a liquid. Of course, changing the temperature can change this situation, either melting the butter or freezing the oil, changing one to a liquid or the other into a solid. Likewise, temperature changes can change the fluidity of a lipid membrane, getting them to move around, getting the molecules to move around more or less within the membrane.